Hey, welcome back and good morning. Beautiful day out there. Hope you're able to get out and enjoy it. So, um, the other day we had Tim White on. He's one of the top experts on New England organized crime and the mafia. One of the other top experts is Michelle McPhee, and we're going to ha- she's going to join us here in a moment. Uh, she's one of the other experts on this topic uh, here in Massachusetts on organized crime and also in uh, in New York. She knows quite a bit about that as well. So we'll have uh, Michelle joining us here in a moment to discuss the Cadillac Frank Salemi trial. Just to give you folks a little background, and you can read all about this on WBSM.com. I've written a couple of pieces on it. Cadillac Frank Salemi uh, is on trial for the murder of Stephen DeSaro, who was a Providence, originally a Providence guy, moved into the Boston area, became involved in a nightclub as the front man and a partner for the Salemis, father and son. Steve Flemmy was involved, Whitey Bulger was involved, and uh, like many of their other business partners, they killed him. Uh, Stephen DeSaro became, a, uh, they suspected he was a witness, or going to become a witness for the government, maybe had testified in front of a grand jury. How they got that information, that could be another FBI scandal. Anyway, he's dead, and he was buried for decades down in Providence, and uh, they found his body because a guy named William Ritchie got caught in a drug deal, marijuana. He gave up Bobby DeLuca. Bobby DeLuca turned around and gave up Frank Salemi. But the interesting part of this, and there's many interesting aspects of it, is that uh, why didn't Frank Salemi just confess to this murder as part of his immunity agreement? I mean, he would not be on trial today if he just admitted to the government that he killed him. It was all part of a package deal, his immunity deal. Who was he protecting? And why was he protecting him? So we're going to talk to Michelle now, uh, Michelle McPhee. You can go to her website. It's Michelle McPhee with one L. One L in Michelle. MichelleMcPhee.com. We've had her on a number of times talking about the marathon bombing, of which she wrote the definitive book on that. But she's also written a number of books and articles and investigative pieces on organized crime. Good morning, Michelle. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I love coming on with you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. So, Michelle... Um, you were in the. Were you in the court the other day? Yes, I was. I mean, it it really was something out of a movie. Who needs uh, mafia films when you have real life New England organized crime? Uh, you know, Cadillac Frank's eighty four years old. He looks every minute of it. He was wheeled into court feebly, and you know he reaches his hand out for his lawyer, Steve Buzang, and gets up and it looks like a you know someone's old grandfather. Uh, and he did that while the jury was seated. At the end of the day, when the jury was no longer in the room, he got up and walked out as able-bodied as any of us. So I'm like, these, this, it, was a, it was a good indicator of the theatrics we can expect during this trial. Oh, that's beautiful, Michelle. That's a, that's a great observation on your part. So I want to talk to a couple aspects about this. You've been covering this for a long time. You've written, for, you've written, written, about, written about it for ABC News, uh, as part of their investigative stuff. You've written books on organized crime. So you and I share a theory that uh, Cadillac Frank Salemi also is responsible for the death of, of, of a state trooper here in Massachusetts. It, well, he didn't pull the trigger. He also didn't strangle Stephen DeSaro. Uh, but but his, his actions have led, led to the death of a state trooper. Why, why don't you talk to our listeners about that? So in 1994, there was a 20-year-old named Michael Romano Jr. from Wakefield who was hanging around with the Salemi soldiers, you know, Steve and Mark Rossetti, uh, David Clark, and there was a bloody war that had been sparked a couple of years earlier when Rico Ponzo decided that he was going to try to wipe out Frank Salemi. And we all remember the infamous shootout at the Bigfoot's Pancake House on Route 1 in Saugus. So Cadillac Frank is seriously wounded in that. He gets information that Rico Ponzo and Darren Buffalino are responsible for the attempted hit on his life. He decides to take out Rico Ponzo, and he sets up this elaborate, you know, assassination. What happened instead was Rico Ponzo was supposed to be changing a flat tire that someone had stabbed out in the parking lot of a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Everett when they were shaking down the owner of the stadium cafe. The owner knew that he was going to have to make his weekly tribute. Um, They knew that Rico Ponzo was going to be picking it up, so they figured they'd take him out there. Well, what happened instead is that Mike Romano gets out to change the tire, and he is shot in the head and dies later that night. Uh, the gunman. Now, this case, mysteriously, has never been solved. It's amazing, isn't it? Bobby Luisi, infamous mob rat. Remember him? Oh, yeah. He's down in Pennsylvania, right? 
No, actually, Bobby Luis, he was, he was a, yes, he was a capo in Philly. Right. He won state's evidence. He testified against Skinny Joe Merlino and that whole crew. He, with sex, the marshals put him undercover as the Reverend Alfonso Esposito <laughs> in Memphis, Tennessee, if you can believe that. And uh, Bobby Luis, he testified in the case, in the trial of Rico Ponzo, and he said that that Mikey Romano hit was done by David Clark, Mark and Steve, you know, uh, Mark was in jail, but Steve Rossetti. And what makes that interesting to people like you and I is after Romano was hit, David Clark flees to Cape Cod to a house that he had in Falmouth, and he gets pulled over as part of a routine traffic stop. He had a broken taillight. State Trooper Mark Charbonnier pulls him over. He gets out gun blazing and shoots and kills Mark Charbonnier. He's wounded. Uh, you know, uh, the trooper gets off around before he succumbs to his injuries. And the big question is, why hasn't anyone been charged in either of these? You know, David Clark is serving life in prison for shooting Mark Charbonnier, but I think there's a bigger avenue of this whole story, and it, and it centers around yet another FBI informant named Mark Rossetti. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's amazing, too. So once again, I think that, you know, that we, is it, I know Stephen Link, the congressman from South Boston, uh, was furious enough to demand answers from the FBI. You know, I know I, I still can't get the report they did on Mark Rossetti's longtime status as a paid informer for the FBI. And there is a report, because and, I tried to find it, too. I can't get it. Yeah, I can. Nope, can't get it. Which, why? Why can't we get it? Mark Rossetti is now serving time on a state drug charge. Um, the Mark Rossetti case, once again, reignited the old tensions that have always existed between the FBI and locals, because, you know how they found out Mark was a rat? The, the state yeah, tell was them. trying to take him down because he was selling heroin all over New England, part of the opioid crisis that was we're now dealing with who knows how many people dropped dead because of the heroin he was selling to kids here in Boston. Uh, so they were trying to take him out for that. They have a wiretap up on him, and they overhear him talking to a guy who promises them, don't worry, I'll take care of you. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Don't worry, we have it under control. And that guy was an FBI agent. It's it was Buckley, so the right? The FBI had lied once again to local authorities about one of their informants. Wasn't that Agent and it Buckley? It did not go over very well. Michelle, wasn't that Agent Buckley who all, who appears in the Whitey Bulger case as well? Correct. That was the FBI so agent. Buckley was Mark Rossetti's handler at the time. And folks, so, so you understand what you're saying is the state police have a wiretap on this well-known capo regime, very violent guy in the mafia, Mark Rossetti, and they hear him talking to an FBI agent. That's how the whole thing comes about. It's incredible that they would ever deal with a guy like this. Who Who is as bad as they come, right? He's as bad as they come. I mean, I laugh because, you know, I live pretty close to the Little League field over here. And uh, Mark Rossetti ran all of his ill-gotten gains, his criminal enterprise, out of a bar called The Bunker. And The Bunker one year actually sponsored the local Little League team. So they had all these <laughs> little kids running around with, you know, mafia shirts. <laughs> <laughs> was M- Michelle is 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 a, is a girl from Eastie. For those of you who don't know, she's from East Boston, and that's where a, a lot of this takes place. Michelle, um, let me ask you this question, because uh, but, but the Mark yeah. Charbonnier thing, I think, is look. You know, there were bodies dropping on both sides of this mob war. We know mm-hmm. that. We also know that the Salami faction mysteriously never went to prison. So you know this. Chris, mm-hmm. There were two factions: the Cross the faction run by Bobby Russo with Mikey Romano, who obviously had vowed revenge for his son's murder. Then there was a Salemi faction with Whitey and that crew. Um, ironically, no one from the Salemi faction ever went to prison. It's amazing. And, you know, there were, there were bodies dropping on both sides, but the only side that was ever indicted federally and spent decades behind bars was the Carrasa faction. It's, it, it's amazing because there's so many unsolved murders and, 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 and so many of them, well, when I say unsolved, they're solved, they're just uncharged, I guess is a better way to put it. They're right? uncharged. The yeah, they're unsure. They know who did it. The government they knows. They know who did it. Bobby Luisi testified to it. And, and how does this relate back to Frank Salemi? Well, I was shocked because I had absolutely no idea that yet um, Frank Salemi's co defendant is a guy named Paul Wiedek. Mm-hmm. And Paul Wiedek's attorneys filed a motion to suppress any evidence of crimes he had committed that are not charged in this case. Mm-hmm. And one of the crimes mentioned in this document was the. He was, quote, participating in the murder of Mike Romano Jr. on September 1st, 1994. It was a staggering line. I'd never heard Paul Weeks' name right. affiliated 
with Mike Romano's murder. And the reason that Mike Romano's murder, I think, is so critical is because that's why Mark Chabonet died. Right. That's why the state trooper the was killed. The committed that murder was fleeing and got pulled over. And you know, the other part, Michelle, that I've always found interesting, because you're right, Way back when, because we, I wrote a blog on this, and we used some of your work at ABC in, in our story, and, and we linked to it um, and credited you with it, but, but it had always, Weedick's name had never shown up. And even, even, the, even Congressman Lynch, who was investigating uh, part of this, we never see his, of course, we don't know what's in that report because they won't re- release it, but, but Weedick, um, who's the co-defendant, it was finally now named as one of these. It's a staggering piece of information. I mean, I haven't even heard of Weedick until now. I don't think a, a lot of, and we pay attention. Well, right, exactly. I had never heard of him until, until I started looking into it, and, and there's some of the affidavits in that, which I don't want to get into now, Mich- Michelle, uh, because there's some more stuff to do on that, but we'll talk about it. It's amazing who he's connected yeah, to, this Weedick um, character. Uh, but well, say that, So it, it, this Weedick character is, is someone worth exploring. Yes. Oh, no, he's, it, he's a very, very interesting guy. M- but my question is this. So way back when, when Salemi had the opportunity to give up everything in his immunity agreement. He could have said he did the DeSaro, he was involved in the DeSaro killing, and, and he would have rolled it in with everything else as part of his immunity agreement. But for some reason or another, he decided not to give that up. And then and neither did DeLuca later, Bobby DeLuca, when he gave it up. Now, the DeLuca seems obvious he didn't want to give his brother up. That makes some sense. But what do you, why do you think Frank Salemi kept this out of his immunity agreement? He wouldn't be on trial today with, if, he had, if he had just admitted to it. Because his kid was involved, his kid picked up picked up Stevie Desaro at his house in uh, Westwood. But wasn't his son dead by the time he he came with to his immunity agreement? You know, that's an interesting question. I, I don't remember the timeline, but maybe he was trying not to. The government claims he was trying to protect his son, now, okay. whether it's his his memory, whether that's you know right. physically. They, they, it's not really clear, but they were trying to protect the government claims. Uh, Frank Jr., Frankie Boy, as they called him. Right. But you know what? Is it something more nefarious because uh, this involves some more of their informants? This, listen, we're talking about the same thing we talked about with Max and Mom, with the Zania brothers. Right. It's, it's this. I, I understand the essential need to have informants. You know, there's a massive story I'm writing right now about MS-13 that would be, we have the largest prosecution of MS-13 in the nation going on right now because of a cooperating witness who went undercover and wore a wire against these guys. Very brave stuff. I understand the need for informants. But when these informants go back, like Mark Rossetti clearly did, like Whitey Bulger clearly did, and like Tamron Zanayev, I believe, clearly did, mm-hmm. there should be some accountability. And that's where local law enforcement gets pissed off. Because, let's be real, has there been any accountability whatsoever for any of these debacles? There really hasn't, and uh, you can. By the way, I mean, John Morris is the only guy who ever went to jail. <laughs> right, and by the and way, it folks, it's kind of funny to me that he's like the one poor kid from the Project Southie, so he's a good patsy for, if, to you know have the whole blame fall on his shoulders. If you if you want to catch up on more of this, you can go to Michelle's website, which is Michelle with one L McPhee dot com. She's got all kinds of stuff, including this Maximum Harm, which we've done a, a lot of interviews with Michelle on it. But that 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 story. They all parallel together. But just, just to finish up with this, this Salemi piece, my, I have a theory, and it's only come to me recently uh, as this trial broke, is that perhaps he was protecting Paul Wiedek and, who, and DeLuca because were those guys maybe taking care of his interests on the street? Did Cadillac Frank Salemi still have interests on the street while he was a government witness? Is that maybe what the government doesn't want to disclose? That they'll say they don't want to talk about the fact that he was protecting these co-defendants. Yeah, they get $28,000 in cash, exactly. which is what they found in the car. Remember, when, when they unearthed DeSaro's body, D.V., I'm sorry, uh, Frank Salemi, Cadillac Frank, was living in a Whitsack apartment in Atlanta, Georgia. So we were paying all his bills. And he, when he finds out the body's been uncovered, he flees. And they find him in Milford, Connecticut, in his car with 28 grand in cash. Right. Well, we- I'm fairly certain being uh, a rat for the FBI is not as lucrative. It's pretty lucrative. <laughs> Can but be. it's not like you're, you're uh, stashing away 28 grand in cash. So your theory hasn't cooled up, given the fact that he had such a colossal amount of money on him when he finally got caught. Right. And because there's, there's a reason why. Because also, um, it, it is publicly known, his son was dying of AIDS. And at the time, AIDS was a death sentence when, when this was all going on. It's not like it is today. I, I, so whether his son was already dead, he was going to be dead. There was no doubt about that. Um, 
You know what would be really interesting is to find out if he got hooked on heroin thanks to Mark Rossetti. Is that what he... Is that, that's how he got AIDS in the first place. You know, what an, in, because he was running around with those guys. Yeah, well, those were his boys. Those were his boys. That was, so that, that was, those were the soldiers. And Rossetti was a well-known heroin dealer. And user. Correct. Yeah. No, this was, we're speaking with Michelle McPhee, who's an investigative reporter, who's covered, an expert on the New England Mafia. Hey, so I had Tim White on here the other day, uh, and you, you know Tim very great well. Great guy, great reporter, yep. Great, great. And uh, we're, we're going to try to get, get you folks back. If we, if we figure this trial is going to go about a month uh, as we get updated on it. Do you have any idea? Uh, I want to see the cigar take the stand. I broke the story. I broke the story. I'm just going to tell you this one little Please. thing. Please. When he, when he cooperated, I got a tip from somebody. And I called his attorney, and I said, hey, I heard your guy join Team Fed. And he's like, no way, not a chance. I go, well, I'll tell you this. I'm standing outside of his house in Rhode Island, and it's completely cleaned out. There's not a liquor furniture in here, and no one's home. And sure enough, it came out that he was, you know, working with the Fed. And, and, and he managed him pretty fast. And this is his this is his first taking of the stand, right? He, he's maybe in grand juries, obviously. Yeah, this will be the first time anyone sees him. So Bobby, you know, um, the cigar de Luca. What makes him so, you know, it would be awesome for you to play for your listeners. Remember, he's one of the guys that pricked his finger and smudged it on a faint and vowed to never rat. He was at the uh, 1989 Mafia initiation ceremony that got bugged by the FBI back in 1989. That's right. He That's where he got made, right? He got made. And then after they killed the sorrow, his brother Joe got made, according to the government. That, that, I, we, I know we have that, 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 uh, the, that audio recording. It was him, Vinny Federico... Um, but it was, and it was all the, the, the cast, the entire Bobby cast. Bobby is the most colorful one. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who do you, when you listen to it. is, who, who do you think, if you're willing to say this, uh, is in charge right now? Is there much of a, of a presence on the street now? Well, Carmen the Cheese Guy's out. He's in my neighborhood now. <laughs> I don't know how active he is, but think about it. You know, um, I think there could be some interesting things happening out in the streets. You know, Bobby Luis, he left the witness protection program. Mark Rosetti's about to get out of jail. The Carrasa faction are all out back on the streets after serving decades behind bars. There could be some interesting stuff. You know, not obviously no one wants to see violence mm-hmm. in the city of Boston, but the, certainly the makings are all there. And, and Matt Google and Matty's out. The same people involved with the war in the 1990s are all back in the same neighborhoods. Now, do you think Rosetti will have any? Do you think he's he'll be welcome back, given the fact that he found he's an FBI informer? Does that doesn't matter anymore? Well, there's some interesting uh, movement on that that I, I'll tell you off the air. Okay, all right. Hey, Michelle, I'm going to let you go. But again, uh, folks, uh, uh, go to her website, Michelle with one L, MichelleMcPhee dot com. Look at her books. Look at her, if you haven't heard her before, we have our interviews with her up on WBSM dot com on Maximum Harm, which is her book on the Boston Marathon bombing. Which, if you're looking for a book to read for the summer. For, you got to go out and get this one. I can't can't praise it enough. Michelle, have a great day. I look forward to speaking with you off the air. Yeah, your stuff has been really good on this, so thanks for having me. Thanks, thanks. All right, have a great day. That was uh, Michelle McPhee. And again, if you just tuned in and you missed any of this, we'll have, I believe we'll have this interview up at some point on uh, WBSM.com. Again, you can uh, check out uh, my blog on, on this. We're going to follow this case pretty closely. We've got some uh, great... Friends in journalism, like uh, Tim White, who's an expert, Michelle's an expert, who, who are attending the trial. So they'll be able to give us updates, and of course they know the history of it. So stay, stay tuned to us. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. If you'd like, when we come back, give me a call, 508-996-0500. It'll be open phones. If it's interesting to you, it's probably interesting to me. 